Welcome in everybody to another Mountain Blade video. Today we are going to dive into the massive 1.8 patch for Bannerlord, specifically the economic changes and why they are amazing for the future of this game. Now for anyone who is uh, looking for the Cliff Notes version, essentially they are making the world economy more dynamic while making trading into the late game, five years plus, significantly more viable. But Let's dive into the patch notes. Uh, I will have a link to these uh, down below in the description uh, if you want to take a look at them for yourself. Now, a quick disclosure before we, you know, hop in right to it. Uh, this is only for trade goods, caravans, and workshops. So these are the trade notes. Everything else is housed elsewhere, and I'll look for another video on that. But I love the way they laid this out for us. Uh, as they started off with, what are the primary issues we thought we should prioritize? What was wrong with their economy? And as much as I love the game, there are definitely some things that need some tweaks. So what did they identify as a problem? The biggest problem they thought they had is overstocking of trade goods in towns. The mother of all problems. And the reason that this is such a big problem is it has massive effects with the abundance of trade goods uh, in the town markets, price index drops to very low. And the problem is it's not only a single trade good being in stock in huge quantities, but every trade good being available in pretty much every town in about five years. And so we've all seen this, I think, when we play the game, where the longer you get into the game, every single town has massive stockpiles of pretty much every trade resource. And from a money-making standpoint, this is a huge problem because it says it here, the price index drops low. When the supply is super high uh, and the demand remains the same, the prices are going to plummet. And specifically for people who are looking to have a trading sort of playthrough, the problem is low profit margins. Low price index means profit margins are low as well. So essentially you get to the point in the game where every resource is pretty cheap across the entire world and there's not an opportunity to have that high profit margin uh, super profitable trade run and so trading really falls off in the later game compared to other different ways of making money and it's really cool that they've addressed this because I think trading is an area that is really unique to this game in how robust and dynamic it could be and it's really nice to see them acknowledging uh, that it's not there yet but that it could be. Uh, caravans and workshops are limited profit potential. <laughs> I completely agree with this. Uh, I think caravans so far, the risk reward isn't there for me. And workshops so far have felt pretty static. You know, you there's a way to min-max it. You put this workshop in this city and you forget about it and just have that passive income for the whole game. Very static, and I felt like they could uh, definitely do a lot more with it. And they even acknowledge it here. Workshop variety has limited effect. You know, you could go to Reddit, look up the best places to put workshops, and you forget about it. For me, I usually ended up uh, in prosperous towns just putting breweries and having a ton of money. So it's nice to see that variety is actually going to matter. We'll see this later in the patch notes, but it's a really, really good change. Variety between town markets is not high, making the game world less interesting. And that they go on to expand on that market homogeneity limiting trade opportunities, limiting how much profit a player can make as the game goes on. And essentially that gets back to the first point of the overstocking in every town. Because there is every good in every town in massive amounts, it is tough to find good trade opportunities, and it makes the world feel static. You know, if you see the same goods in a Sturgeon market as you do over in the Kazoot land or over in the Butter Kingdom... The world doesn't feel as rich and diverse and dynamic as it possibly could be. Um, and beyond just being able to make money with trading, what I would love to see them do is have specific resources or crafts uh, localized in certain areas to make the world feel rich and vibrant. And you know what I'm talking about. I'd love for there to be, you know, late in the game, uh, you go up to the Sturgeon land and you get, let's say, Sturgeon steel because it's the best in the game. And you go over and you sell that in the Batanian lands for a hefty profit because they need that steel for their two-handed weapons. Maybe they've recently gone to war. 
And then from that profit, you pick up some of the Batanian lumber. You bring that over to the Butter Kingdom where they need it for crossbows. And you get the idea. But having these dynamic trade routes and opportunities based on where you're going, I think would go a long way to make the world feel vibrant. And it is great to see that they've acknowledged that as well. I think that's something that they can really do to make this game even better and more unique uh, as we move forward. So this is one I didn't have an issue with. With limited profits, trade skill XP gain is also curved severely, making it harder than intended to increase the trade skill. For anyone who doesn't know, you increase your trade skill by buying at one price and selling it at a higher price somewhere else. Uh, I honestly never really had an issue with getting you know past 200 with the trade skill, uh, but it's nice that they're kind of making it a little bit more accessible. So it did take a minute to uh, think about how to do that. And this last one, I, I couldn't agree more. Trade gameplay in general is less rewarding, even for making money compared to more mainstream methods. This is particularly true as the game gets later and later. Uh, if you're looking for, you know, the meta way to uh, make money, trade really doesn't even enter the conversation right now. So it's really cool that they've acknowledged all of these issues and how they're fixing them actually makes a lot of sense. And I was really impressed. Um, so what are the changes? Well, to address that first problem of oversupply, well, they've increased the demand uh, for trade goods. And to understand a little more, demand is based on the prosperity of the town multiplied by demand of the, uh, the value for a certain good. And what they've done, the demand is up three to four times more, so towns simply consume more trade goods. And I think that's a, a super smart way to fix some of the issues with that oversupply, as well as the price. Because basic economics if supply remains fixed but demand goes up particularly by three or four x well prices are going to go up too and what we're also going to see is that they're going to start to chew through those trade resources uh significantly faster with that increased demand uh giving rise to a more interactive world economy i think as well as you're not just getting the case where every town is stockpiling every good which is nice this second part, I really think, is great at increasing the longevity of the trading style in the game by adding luxury demands. Uh, it says here that they had uh, a luxury demand system in the game, but they made it moot. They essentially nerfed it or made it to the point that it had no impact. And they're adding it back, which is great. And the difference with luxury and base demand values is... Luxury demand only kicks in after a town reaches a certain prosperity value, meaning later in the game. And I think this really creates a, a more vibrant life cycle of the economy. You know, at the beginning where there's not a lot of prosperity, there's not a lot of goods, you're probably selling grain or lumber or, you know, these kind of base goods. And as the game gets later and these towns get more and more prosperous, well, their demand for jewelry, wine, furs is going to go up. And hopefully at that point, you're richer as well. And you can start dabbling in these higher profit margin uh, luxury items. And it gives the, again, it makes it feel like the economy isn't just stagnant. It is growing. It is evolving over the game. As you become better and better at trading, uh, you get new opportunities. And I think that's adding that luxury demand, I think, really... Um, is going to increase the longevity of trading. And we'll actually see those values later on, so stick with us. They literally list them out, and it's really cool to see. So these next four, there are production or there's schedules for what exactly was changed a little bit later, uh, and I will show you those, so we will just kind of gloss over these. But essentially, they are adjusting everything. They're adjusting the production of villages, production of workshops, the value of trade goods, and the expense for workshops are drastically increased. And so, again, all of these schedules are laid out a little bit later, uh, so we'll get there. But some really nice tweaks, I think, again, just to make it more dynamic uh, and feel like a living, breathing world. Uh, some trade goods are not produced by artisans in the cities anymore. They'll only be produced by their respective workshops. And that might seem like a small little tweak, and we'll see exactly which ones they stop producing. But it makes the tactical decisions for workshop require a little bit more planning and thinking and the ability to 
optimize as opportunities arise, given that their artisans aren't producing certain goods, I think is really going to go a long way uh, to making workshops feel less like a tack on and more like uh, an interactive way to, uh, you know, continue your trade playthrough, which I think is a really smart way to do it. Uh, this is one that actually uh, <laughs> has been very funny to see. The amount of production simulated at the start, uh, at the game start, is reduced to five days from 20 days. So essentially what they do at the beginning of the game, when you started a new game, they would simulate 20 days worth of production so that all of the markets at least had some goods. I'm sure you notice in your games early on uh, where the markets felt emptier, uh, and then obviously they would stockpile as they move on. Well, they've reduced the amount of simulated uh, production cycles. They've cut it by 75%. And it, you can really feel it when you start a new game that the markets feel very barren. But what I, th why I think this is a good change personally is it takes a little bit more time for the economy to get up and running. And so it gives you a little bit more of a cushion to make some money and get ready to be a big part of the economy as it ramps up. Um, and just gives you a little bit more of a runway there uh, so that you have the ability to participate as the market is growing as a lot of the times trading in the early game feels the best, and this gives you more opportunity to do that. Again, another cool dynamic workshop difference. Workshop production only cycles in case of possible profit instead of always. What does that mean? Right now, before 1.8, workshops are always producing, regardless if they're making a profit in their current city. What will happen now is your workshop productions will only work if they can make money given uh, what the current market is in the city they're in. And again, this just makes the work sh entire workshop experience a little bit more dynamic where you have to you know, put a little bit of thought and planning, maybe even change the production of certain workshops to match what is going on in the city. But again, just another way to make it feel more interactive versus a super passive set it and forget it type of situation. And so what do these changes mean when they're all put together? Essentially, they're trying to balance out the economy because right now the supply is significantly outpacing the demand, right? And so they are trying to get them more in line with each other. We saw the demand changes so that overstocking is much more rare. It means price indices are as low as possible five years into the game. They're trying to extend the longevity of trading as these games can go for a super, super long time. Uh, so this is the primary change that they've built the rest of onto. And again, look, I said, just said it. The buying and selling is still viable even very late into the game because there is going to be a mismatch in the supply and demand between different cities, uh, particularly as facilitated by the increased demand, should create some really good buying and selling opportunities if you want to continue to be a trader. Yeah, trader gameplay is more viable. Exactly. Um, trade skill experience is gained for making profits from trading. So you'll be able to gain trade skills even later into the game. If it's a secondary um, objective for you to be able to trade, the fact that you can make profit later into the game makes it possible for you to continue to build that skill even past the five-year mark. And this is when I talk about the world feeling more dynamic, more interactive, more alive. When you're traveling around the map and visiting towns, you'll see different markets with different inventories and prices actually making it more fun to trade. So right now, again, you get to the point where every market has the same stuff. But if you're getting in a situation where uh, the supply is significantly limited of certain goods in one area versus another, it makes the world feel vibrant. It gives you a reason to move around and trade. And it gets you out of just picking this is the most optimal route to this is the opportunity that the world has presented me. And I'm going to go take advantage of it. We've, uh, here's another way that you can impact the trade in the world. We've made it so various events like raids and sieges have a much bigger impact on the prices and availability in the market. You can visit a town right after a long siege and see if they want anything you might provide. Or raiding a village of the same produce, you can affect the prices to a much more recognizable degree. So the actual events that are happening in the world, the wars, the fighting, the raiding, has an impact on the economy as it should. And so I think that's just another dynamic step to make it the world feel more vibrant and that your actions and the actions of other folks uh, increase the depth 
uh, by having an impact. And what that ultimately allows you to do increases replayability and increases kind of the, the variability within each of your playthroughs. Yeah, trading style of traveling the land, visiting many towns, making various trade routes uh, on the way and trying to catch opportunities. You're trying to find the best opportunities versus before where I felt static, it was this trade route's the best. So I think that's really good. Uh, luxury demands, you know, we talked about that. We'll touch on the exact schedule later. But uh, you can rely on your knowledge of the prosperity of towns to figure out where you should sell those goods. Just another way to be profitable. Um sell grain and hardwood pretty much anywhere, the lower tier stuff. If you landed some cheap jewelry or silk, go to a big rich town and find a market for it. I think that makes total sense. And this is cool. Again, one of the other changes in addition to making it more dynamic, it feels like there is now a greater life cycle to the economy, you know, a beginning, middle, end. And they talked about it. The overall prosperity value increases as the game time passes. Things go up. So certain trade goods and workshops that have limited trade and profit potential can start to be more valuable later in the game. So jewelry might not sell well early game, but as towns become more profitable, it be could become one of the most profitable uh, workshops or trade resources. And again, just cool to see how it's developing from beginning to middle to end. So with all of those changes to supply and demand, obviously you're going to help caravans and workshops but they've also tweaked how they work. Changes to caravan behavior. They were acting too safe. Tell that to all my caravans that got killed when deciding what to buy uh, for economic decisions. Of course, they'll still run into bandits. Price indices more varied. Instead of rock bottom, we have a chance to get them to take more risk. So because the prices are, are more varied based on the supply and demand, they have the potential to make more profit. Make better use of their animals of burden, increasing their carrying capacity, thus increasing profits. Trading being more profitable means care. So they're just trying to make caravans more viable. They have not been viable up to this point, in my opinion, particularly as you get late game when you're doing wars. But it's nice to see that they are uh, they're trying to make it. Workshops. Profits means more money for workshops with the heterogeneity. Sorry if I butchered that word of trade goods, meaning different trade goods in different areas. It's important to make the correct decisions on what kind of workshops to buy. I love this because you actually have to think versus, oh, this is obviously just optimal. Uh, it makes the workshops, again, I've said it a couple times now, a lot more dynamic. Trade goods being abundant, the amount of raw materials consumed by a workshop was not making a dent in the supply. True. No matter how many work, you could have four breweries in the same town and green was still going to be abundant and did not affect prices. Now, even if we did increase their consumption, a town smithy will have higher prices for iron ore. So the workshop you have increased the prices there. That makes sense. This is one uh, thing I, that's nice that they're targeting the AI and not just us. Workshops have had daily expenses. And essentially what they were relying on that expense mechanic for AI controlled workshops was for them to go out of business so that someone else would buy the shop. They would change it to accurately reflect what was happening in that city they are increasing the expense so that's going to happen more often so that the actual shops reflect what the city uh, needs and values and again it just makes the game more dynamic because you never know which shops are going to go under which ones are going to pop up uh, very cool yeah because okay so before 1.8 if they did not make a single profit it would take 14 years straight of zero profit to go out of business. Um, yeah, so now that workshops are having more profit, they can increase the expenses. This will allow AI-controlled workshops to go out of business, be bought by someone new, and cycle as intended. And yes, now we actually have to think a bit more since workshops can actually run a deficit. Very cool. So workshops producing luxury goods are more profitable late game. So again, all of these changes were designed to make the game feel more dynamic, uh, the world to feel more alive and vibrant, and I think they hit the nail on the head. Now for some of uh, what we were talking about earlier, the demand changes. So what we see here, we have base demand, luxury demand, uh, what they were, and what they've changed to. So grain, obviously not a luxury good, zero luxury demand, zero here, but the overall demand has increased. But then we look at some other stuff where butter 
has gone from a four luxury demand to 25. You know, that's what, like a 6x increase. Grapes from 3 to 20. So you can see here they are actively implementing these luxury good demands. Uh, so as the game gets later, these are going to be more in demand, more scarce, more profit. Uh, it's a beautiful thing for us to see. Um, we see a lot of the demands just overall just straight up increasing, particularly the uh, for luxury goods. You know, we see wine is 9 and 3. Now it's 15 and 30. So they're going to be chewing up these resources, uh, and it's really exciting to see. These are just some base value changes. Again, it really looks like they are targeting the luxury goods and making them more profitable. You know, jewelry doubled in price, pottery doubled in price, linen over doubled, uh, fur, wow, uh, you know, almost 4x. So particularly in the luxury goods, they're increasing the value to make it it's just so much more profitable late game. Now for the workshop, um, their daily expenses increased from 20 to 100, 5x there. And again, that's to cycle the shops from the AI perspective, as well as to make us think a little bit more uh, about how we are putting or where we're putting our workshops. And now uh, there's some changes into the way the output is working. We have conversion speed and output count. Conversion speed is how many production runs a workshop makes in a day, how many cycles it goes through. And the output count is the amount of goods a workshop produces in a production run. And so we see it looks like there's been some slight nerfs. You know, we've gone from one output count on eight production cycles, eight for the brewery, to 3.5 and two, which is seven per day. So a slight nerf. And it looks like that's pretty, uh, pretty steady across the board. Wine you know, cut in half, but they output twice as much. Conversion speed down, output up. It's a pretty consistent cycle. And again, they're just trying to, it looks like, um, produce roughly the same amount of goods, but consume less raw materials. So it looks like they're really trying to, um, to tweak the workshops to work as intended. As I said before, artisans won't produce linen, beer, leather, and jewelry and so you'll have to rely on workshops to do that and as we saw jewelry going up leather going up in price as well as demand really makes for some exciting late game opportunities where maybe you're switching early production for late production as uh, the place gets more profitable um, we've talked about the before game start production here are the village daily production changes here you know we see grain go up but clay down Iron down, fish down, vineyard way down, wine looks to be profitable, trapper down. So again, just making a lot of these changes to uh, tweak the economy. And the other thing we mentioned before, workshops will not make a production run if it is not going to be a profitable or break even with local market prices. That's for us. Um, and so this is just, again, another way to make the world feel more vibrant and dynamic. But these are the extensive list of changes. I am super excited to see how this plays out uh, over the long term in a game. And as always, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. And I hope to see you in the next one.